I say we start? Let's start. Okay. So, just set up my on my screen. So hi everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, for those in the States, good afternoon in Europe, and good evening here in Asia. Uh, welcome to our session. And just a few reminders, please put your name on Zoom, on your Zoom screen, and add your affiliation if you wish, your pronouns if you wish. And please uh, set your Zoom to gallery view later on, and turn on your cameras if you are able, so that we can all see each other. Uh, Mary has muted all of us, so uh, make sure that you continue to be muted in this session. So welcome to uh, socialization of adolescence and religious education approaches and to our collaborative session, Listening to the Spirit Together, which will take the form of a synodal conversation. In this gathering, our aim is to create a space where we, as a community of religious education scholars and teachers, can listen together to the Holy Spirit. Within this space, we hope to listen to the Spirit through each one of us and how the Spirit calls us to better accompany the young people we encounter in our ministries. For this year at the REA, we are trying something different, combining a collaborative session with paper presentations. Not only are we going to engage in a possible approach for our ministries, but we are also featuring two paper presentations for colleagues within the Synodal Conversation. The first presentation will be from Diana Liveras, hi Diane, uh, who will talk about the practice of Ignatian discernment for adolescents in the age of social media. And the second will be from Patrick Manning, who will share about a responsive religious education for disaffiliating youth. In this session, we want to introduce an approach to communal discernment by engaging in it together within this online space. Over the past two years, the Catholic Church worldwide has embarked in this process of communal discernment, calling all of its members to reflect on the meaning of journeying together as a global community and how the Spirit is calling and leading them to grow into a more synodal church. This method of synodality will be our guide as we do communal discernment today. The synodal method can be described as a conversation in the spirit in which participants are invited to listen to one another, to draw closer to one another, and to listen together to the spirit speaking to the community, calling all of us into action. The conversation goes beyond exchanging ideas as we usually do in academic conferences. It involves a spiritual listening done as shared prayer in communal discernment. The synodal method we will do today can be understood in three movements. First, we start where we are. We provide the space for each participant to share your experiences and thoughts related to the topic and the discernment question. One of the core convictions of synodality is that all participants have something to say by virtue of their baptismal dignity. And as such, the Spirit speaks to everyone, and therefore we have to listen. Second, we listen to the Spirit together. In this movement, we create a space for each participant to share what deeply touched you and what challenges you after reflecting on the first movement. The goal is for us to listen to our inner movements where we can hear the Spirit's voice. And finally, we begin walking together as religious educators. The third movement is the space for us to identify the key points that have emerged in our communal discernment, and we want to try to build consensus on how we should act as a community of religious educators in our own context. The synodal method is also enriched by Ignatian spirituality. Synodality presumes not just that God speaks to each one of us and draws us toward God's self in and through specific mission, but that we have a way to listen and find God in all things, that is, through Ignatian discernment in general and in a more structured way through the practice of the spiritual exercises, especially the discernment of spirits. In the spiritual exercises, we are asked to name the grace that we seek, distinguish whether we are moving towards God, love, greater freedom, and generosity, permission, consolation, or further away from peace, desolation. And finally, we end with expressing what we need to do and who we need to be in response to our call and mission. So hopefully this online space will be meaningful for everyone and hopefully we can listen to the spirit together as a community of religious educators from wherever we are in the world today. So welcome to this space. So 
with everyone settled down, uh, let's listen to our colleagues who will provide us with insights to frame our simple conversation. So we're going to have the two paper presentations first. Uh, Diane will present first, and then Patrick. And then we will uh, reserve the question and answers for Diane and Patrick at, at the very end of our time together. So after, after the paper presentations, we'll have the synodal conversation, and then we'll have the open forum. Okay. So the first uh, presenter is Diane Oliveras. Diane Francesca Oliveras is a PhD student in theology and education at Boston College. And prior to pursuing doctoral studies, she was teaching theology to undergraduate students at the Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines. Her research interests include teaching theology to young adults that engages feminist liberation and post-colonial theologies and critical and contemplative pedagogies and practices. So without further ado, Diane, take it away. Um. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Raphael. I'll just um, share my screen. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for the time, um, for being here, for taking time to read our papers. And I look forward to our conversation alongside um, Patrick's paper. And I'm also excited to participate in this synodal process. Um, so my paper is entitled The Practice of Ignatian Discernment for Adolescents in the Age of Social Media. Here I propose that the practice of Ignatian discernment can be a site to adapt the proposals from developmental theory towards assisting young people in situating themselves and their decisions as they use social media in accordance with Christianity's vision. Um, and so to make this proposal, my paper had five sections, as you see here in the screen, and I'll briefly go through all of them in this presentation. So first, the personhood and relationships in the Christian horizon. So horizon is, um, is a vision for understanding and valuing oneself, others, and the relationship in between, thereby offering a sense of direction for how to live meaningfully in the world. One understanding of the project of adolescence is that adolescents situate themselves within a broader and meaningful horizon that is shared with a community. The church as a faith community offers the horizon of God's abiding presence and infinite love as the person's central relationship that shapes all other relationships such that these are of love, mutuality, and justice. In this horizon, God's love is the source of the inherent dignity and the enduring value of the person. This is contrary to the perception that one's value is earned through one's achievements or acquisitions. And it's also contrary to the perception that some people are more valuable than others. And so Theresa O'Keefe's work is one of the texts um, I cite in my work. Um, here she said, talks about what it means to be a person. To, to be a person means three things, to be freely giving of oneself, to be in communion, in relationship, and to be unique among humans in that free gift of self. The discovery of personhood only happens in relationships of love. To recognize oneself as beloved and therefore having enduring value happens in and not apart from loving relationship with God and others. So following this thread, loving relationships can be characterized through um, by three points. So first, the free gift, uh, free and generous self-gift to other persons in our relationships. Second, the uniqueness of persons is recognized and nourished. And consequently, these relationships respect and encourage diversity among persons. And then finally, right relationships are against individual actions and social structures that distort the foundation search of the dignity of every person and these structures that commit violence against them. So these descriptions of personhood and right relationships are guides for adolescents who are becoming more conscious of the nature of their relationships and their capacity to shape these relationships. The church can accompany adolescents by offering them a meaningful horizon that engages their meaning-making capacities. The work of developmental psychology and constructive developmental theory can help us recognize these capacities. 
older adolescents are becoming more conscious of the need for a sense of purpose to guide their lives and their capacity to choose meaning-making frameworks to situate themselves in their lives. From a, from a constructive developmental perspective, Robert Keegan describes the gradual shift, um, non-linear shift occurring in adolescents until early adulthood as the transformation from the second order of consciousness to third order. An individual on second order can name and communicate their point of view on a matter at hand and can recognize another person's point of view as similar or different from their own. However, they struggle to recognize the value and validity of the other person's differing perspective as they hold on to their own. The shift to third order allows persons to recognize their point of view as an object to be situated within the notion of mutual interest, where different points of view are valued. Third order consciousness and its implications for one's capacity to empathize with others are essential for being responsible in interpersonal, interpersonal relationships and in relationships with society. So to facilitate the shift from second to third order, adolescents need a holding environment that offers a balance of support and challenge. Such environments set within a community need to engage adolescents' initial desire for self-enhancement or, in, or, or interest towards mutual interest. Both Keegan and positive youth development studies highlight the need for positive relationships wherein adults accompany adolescents in the interpretative work necessary to relate with others responsibly and to recognize their agency and skills and an environment wherein they are encouraged to offer their perspective and use their skills for, develop, for their development and to contribute to the well-being of a broader community. As the church offers God as the ultimate horizon, it should attend to the capacities for meaning-making of adolescents and, to, and also recognize aspects of dominant culture that challenge these claims. Um, and so with this, um, I start talking about the challenges posed by social media as an experience of that dominant culture. So the widespread and constant use of social media influences the youth's development, including their perception of themselves and others. And for this reason, the church should consider it in their ministry to youth. I propose considering aspects of the cultural context in the Philippines in relation to this engagement with social media. Um, I named the culture of consumption, cancel culture, and pol polarizing approaches to social issues. So the culture of consumption operates on the narrative that the person's happiness is dependent on what one consumes, which is promoted and reinforced, reinforced through social media. And this promotes a provisional sense of self-value. It also promotes an un, um, unreflective practices, for example, not considering whether a product may be coming from unjust labor practices. So the culture of consumption promotes an understanding of the person and one's relationship with others that is contrary to this enduring sense of value of every person. It's also contrary to their call to right relationships. The cancel culture and the polarizing discourses online influences how ad adolescents engage with other people. Cancel culture is the practice of calling out, excluding, or dismissing someone who has done something that is perceived, perceived to be unjust or unethical. Cancel culture affects both interpersonal relationships and individuals' participation in civil society. The prevalence of cancel culture and eco chambers and social media platforms bring only like-minded people together and does not foster dialogue with other views. It does not foster empathy and the capacity to value the views of other people as part of the process of discerning what is it that contributes to the common good. By keeping persons among similar-minded people, they are less likely to hear about the needs of those coming from a different position and consequently, they fail to respond to these persons' needs. Cancel culture does not recognize the inherent value of persons, wherein the significance is reduced to particular actions and does not make space for forgiveness. The church should assist adolescents in nav navigating this context 
where where certain cultural aspects are either dehumanizing or extremely polarizing. This does not mean that we are called to, to abandon the digital platform. The church also needs to recognize, or they also need to encourage promising signs wherein young people are organizing for various advocacies and protests against unjust practices in society by using social media. The church can accompany adolescents to grow in their capacity to empathize and respect the other regardless of differences. So the church is a place for ongoing formation of young people and in fact all persons in relating responsibly. The church seeks to foster relationships of empathy, respect, mutuality, and solidarity in the community, and to relate similarly with people beyond the community. Young people learn to love because they, are, they have experienced the grace of God's unconditional love through loving relationships with other people. Considering the capacities and needs of adolescents from the lens of constructive developmental theory and PYD theory, Adolescents can grow in sharing this vision through having opportunities to exercise their agency and to have positive relationships with adults, which I will call mentoring relationships that offer support and challenge. So the practice of Ignatian discernment can be the space for mentoring relationships to offer guidance, support, and challenge to young people in the Philippines as they use social media. There are two distinct kinds of discernment in the practice of St. Ignatius of Loyola. One is the discernment of spirits, and one is the discernment of God's will. Of course, in practice, they overlap, but it's helpful to distinguish between the two. So um, Ignatian spirituality scholar Barton Gager defines discernment of spirits as the process in which people analyze their own thoughts, emotions, and desires or they analyze someone else's in order to determine their quality and origin. So we're asking which of these movements are coming from God, what are coming from the enemy or the evil spirit, and which are coming from human sources. Okay. Um, another scholar, Dean Brackley, describes the two key emotional states in the discernment of spirit. So consolation or spiritual consolation and spiritual desolation. Brackley um, speaks about spiritual consolation as the peace and joy that arises from our center and affect our interior state as a whole. It releases new energies, widens our vision, and directs us beyond ourselves. Desolation, on the other hand, is sadness and inner turmoil. It is a disturbance arising from deep within and therefore touching us globally. It attracts us to the gospel of satisfaction and draws, back, draws us backward into ourselves. Okay. Now, the discernment of God's will, on the other hand, is about choosing between two or more good options. It considers what contributes to the universal good. It is about God calling us to participate in God's work in the world. Um, so mentors in the church can assist young people in recognizing how God is personally speaking to them and moving in their own lives through the discernment of spirits. Through discerning God's will, uh, persons are considering how God directs our deepest desires towards greater service to others. So these, I think, are helpful points of conversation in this within this mentoring relationship with young people. Um, this practice, along with mentoring relationships, can accompany young people in navigating the challenges to the Christian vision in the Philippine context. So I say the discernment of spirits can guide adolescents in exercising their prophetic tasks by helping them identify and respond to inclinations that could hinder this task. This helps them to recognize the temptation to go with the flow of dominant culture as leading one away from responding to God's call and to build right relationships. So because of that, consequently, the rules also tell us, uh, the rules of Ignatius tells, tells us to act deci decisively against these temptations. So the cancel culture and polarizing discourses and political issues also call for self-reflection. At times, our participation may seem that they are rooted in good intentions, such as speaking against injustices or correcting fake news. But as the rules of Ignatius point out, 
even good intentions need to be discerned, particularly whether these actions truly bear good fruit. So cancel culture does not make space for forgiveness, reconciliation, and reconciliation that are called for in right relationships. So mindful of how polarizing discourses prevent people from constructive engagement and from listening to one another, actions that further divide and should be resisted. So here I'm saying a commitment to the truth is not only about correcting fake news, but also promoting right relationships. So in the same vein, one should resist the comfort of political eco chambers by intentionally being in dialogue where mutual listening happens online or offline with persons or groups who have different points of view on social issues. This reflective practice of discernment assists adolescents towards becoming less impulsive in their engagement. Over time, this also helps them to recognize and resist unhealthy behaviors, behaviors towards healthier engagements in social media. Following the rules of St. Ignatius helps them grow in their capacity to be responsible for their actions, to care for other well others' well-being, and to build right relationships with other people. Um, so briefly, discerning God's will can also be a way for adolescents to consider how they are being called to direct their passions and their gifts in the service of the church and society. And this includes how they are called to respond to the sociocultural challenges posed by social media. Peers can discern together how they can resist cultural practices that do not recognize the enduring value of persons. That is, they sow division, um, those, um, sorry, those go against those practices that sow division and prevent productive dialogue. Um, peers can also offer each other support in this commitment. So just in conclusion, I'm here, again, I've been proposing that discernment is a practice learned gradually with accompaniment of spiritually mature adults in the Christian community who can serve as mentors or mentoring communities that respect the agency and gifts of young people. The practice of discernment assists adolescents to use social media in a way that situate themselves, others, and their relationships in the horizon of God's enduring love. Okay, so. Thank you, everyone, for listening. All right. Thank you, Diane. Let's give a non-line round of applause for Diane. Yay. Okay. Uh, Diane has given us so much to think about. Uh, let's just take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. And since we'll be having our questions at the end, uh, you, you feel free to write down I will have the question and answers at the end. Uh, feel free to write down your uh, your questions in your notebook, or you can put it on the chat so that the end can respond to that later. Okay. All right. Now let's move on to the second paper, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, the second paper is by Dr. Patrick Manning. Uh, Patrick Manning is an associate professor of pastoral theology at the Immaculate Conception Seminary School of Theology at Seton Hall University in New Jersey. He is the author of Converting the Imagination, Teaching to Recover Jesus' Vision for Fullness of Life, published through the REA's Horizon series. So uh, check it out. Uh, and is currently working on a book on the gifts of the contemplative tradition for Christian education today. He, uh, he is a husband and father of three children, who have taught them many of the most important things he has learned in life. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Patrick, please take it away. All right. Um, thank you so much to uh, Raphael for facilitating the conversation. Uh, it's good to see everyone this morning. Um, so just as uh, my, my children have taught me many, many things, uh, the, the area that we're touching on uh, this morning is I, I would not consider myself a, a foremost expert. I've learned from many people in this uh, virtual room, in, including uh, Teresa O'Keefe, I think I saw here. Um, but writing this paper has been helpful to me in, in thinking through some of my own experiences and, um, and thoughts, and uh, hopefully it'll be helpful to some other people as well. Um, but taking a cue from the proposal for this year's meeting, um, I took this paper as an opportunity to, to think about a couple of questions, uh, to think about 
how religious education is shaped and, and who does the shaping and thinking about that, uh, like Diane, specifically with reference to adolescents and, and young adults. Um, so, of course, when we're, we are talking about young people, adolescents and young adults, uh, we are certainly talking about beloved children of God, uh, but not mere children. Um, and yet I think there are many vestiges in uh, our, uh, our systems, our uh, instant uh, instantiations of religious education uh, in which we continue to treat people uh, like, like children, uh, whether intentionally or not. Sometimes that might be uh, implicit in the structures or our habits of educating um, if it's not outright infantilizing at, at times. Um, and even if it isn't uh, explicitly infantilizing, I think uh, one way in which our ways of educating fall short is that, uh, is that we do not uh, encourage people to be mature Christians. Uh, this is a phrase that Diane used to talk about people becoming spiritually mature. This is something Pope Francis has written about. Um, the mode of educating, uh, even if it doesn't have ill intent behind it, uh, does not create the conditions for a person to really become uh, mature in faith, to really appropriate uh, the faith and to live from it uh, on, on their own terms. Uh, and a lot of our, our young people, um, they pick up on this. Uh, they, they realize this uh, and they don't like it. Um, so there is a, often a, a misfit between our ways of educating religiously uh, and the, the needs, uh, the preferences, the styles of the young people that we are purporting to, to educate. Um, so in the spirit of, of this session this morning, um, I certainly want to lift up this theme of listening, that it, it's crucial uh, that we listen to, uh, to the young people themselves. Um, and so one, one really um, wonderful model of this um, some people in the crowd may have seen, but recently uh, Disney, of all people, uh, put out a, a documentary that in the original Spanish was called uh, Amen Francisco Responde. Uh, it was, I think in English it was translated to Pope Answers. Uh, and it was a fascinating dialogue between Pope Francis and a group of young people. Uh, it's a larger group than what you can see in the picture here. Um, but I'm going to... Um, draw and uh, allude to some of the stories that emerged in this dialogue that the Pope had with, uh, with these young people as I'm sort of talking through some of these points this morning. Um, so in, in general, um, when we think about uh, our young people, I said that our, our ways of educating today in our schools and our congregations, uh, there's often a misfit with the needs, the, the desires of young people today. Um, so our, our young people, our younger generations, really like all of us are, um, are looking for uh, a life that's meaningful and happy. Um, they are looking for a life that is more stable given that they are growing up in uh, an era of environmental crisis and um, a global pandemic, political crisis around the country, around the world. Um, they are looking to be healthier, uh, particularly in the area of mental health. Um, they want a life that is more meaningful, uh, and they do often want a life that is more spiritual, that has greater depth to it. Um, but above all, um, what we hear from our young people uh, is that they are looking for a, a life that is shared with others uh, who, who care about them. Um, so this is, I'm painting in just very broad strokes, um, some of the background that obviously in the paper, I, I try to listen much more in depth to what we're hearing from young people about what, what is the kind of life that they want from them, themselves uh, and what are the hopes from uh, their religious education or their religious formation. Um, so as I said, there are some points of tension between these needs, these desires of young people and the ways that we have often educated uh, religiously in the past and continuing into the future. Some of these things that uh, continue to be sort of a, a hangover that, that we can't shake in our modes of religious education. So um, just to highlight briefly, a few of what I see to be some of the, the points of tension. 
uh, in this uh, in, in an older model of religious education. Um, so one would be the fact that often we have educated in, in ways that presume respect for uh, and trust in religious authorities uh, that these young people do not have. Um, so to give an example, um, there in this dialogue with Pope Francis, uh, there was one young man uh, who, when he was in high school, was abused uh, by a teacher uh, at his at his Catholic high school. Uh, and when the church investigated it, they sided with the abuser. Um, there was another young woman uh, speaking with Pope Francis who uh, had formerly spent some time in a convent uh, and experienced uh, manipulation at the hands of her superior uh, there in the convent. So, you know, these are particular and, and very traumatic experiences that these two young people have experienced. And even if uh, other young people haven't had the, the same experiences directly themselves, uh, chances are very good these days that they know someone who has had such a traumatic experience at the hands of, of church officials. Uh, if not, they are certainly aware of, uh, of the sex abuse scandal um, that has happened within the church. And so because of these sort of things, because this is there in the backdrop, uh, many, if not most, young people are suspicious of institutions, suspicious of religious authorities, uh, and do not have the kind of deference uh, to those authorities that is often presumed in, in the ways that we educate. Um, another point of tension in, in the older model is that it is built upon authoritative answers uh, to major religious and existential questions. Uh, we, we all have these important, the big, you know, the big questions that Sharon Dose Parks talks about. Um, we all have these big questions and religion uh, offers responses, answers answers to these. Um, and in a tradition like Catholicism, uh, often these answers are presented as authoritative, uh, magisterial. Uh, and this is something that young people chafe against. Um, they, they have told us very explicitly, uh, they, they do not want to be fed answers. Uh, they want to be able to explore. They want to seek. This is a, our younger generations are very uh, accustomed and adept at seeking answers, taking out their, uh, their own phones uh, and finding information on their own terms, or sometimes uh, in a conversation with their peers. Uh, what some of the more interesting moments in this uh, dialogue uh, between the young people and Pope Francis uh, were where um, Pope Francis was actually in a sense marginalized in the conversation where they, the young people seized upon a topic um, and Pope Francis said nothing and no one addressed him uh, for long stretches of time as these young people talked with themselves. Uh, and I think there's something that there that is indicative there of these younger generations that they they do not default to turning to authorities. They do not uh, are not looking for necessarily authoritative answers. They want to seek the answers uh, themselves. Uh, and the third point of tension is that some of our our uh, custom modes of educating presume religious affiliation and identification. But as I've already said, young people are suspicious of, of institutions, uh, many of them, uh, and often feel constrained uh, by uh, identifying solely with one institution or seeing themselves uh, within the bounds of one institution. And it's something of what is uh, what I'm trying to capture in this image on your screen uh, is a mode of educating that wants to put people in and keep people uh, in a box, in a contained space to say what it means to be Catholic or, uh, or Methodist or Baptist uh, means to be within this very narrowly constrained space. Uh, and that's something that, uh, that younger generations often have an allergy to. Um, they feel very free um, to, uh, to cross boundaries of religious affiliation. Um, to, to sort of uh, to remix as uh, James Nagel has referred to it. Um, and that's if they engage religion at all. Uh, very many are beginning to seek lives of meaning and spirituality outside of institutions, uh, religious institutions entirely. A couple of examples of this, there were um, two young people in this dialogue with Pope Francis who identified as, as gay. 
Um, and as is very commonly the the experience um, with with such um, such folks, they uh, often did not find themselves at home within the Catholic Church, um, and were finding their way uh, by perhaps keeping one foot foot in, one foot out, or just seeking uh, a spiritual life entirely outside of Catholicism. Okay. So, so I just want to gesture here towards a few of those points of tension when I say that there, some of our older ways of educating might, there might be a misfit uh, with, uh, with the younger people who we are purporting to educate. So what might be uh, a better fit? What might be the ways or modes of educating religiously that might be uh, more helpful uh, for younger generations? Um, so to, to take a phrase that uh, Diane has already employed, uh, it, you know, in a word, uh, I would say it, we should be thinking about religious education as accompaniment, uh, as sharing a journey uh, with uh, with fellow Christians or fellow seekers, um, rather than putting them in a, into a particular box or leading them by uh, by the hand, uh, is accompaniment in a journey leading to mature faith, uh, where people can appropriate the faith on their own terms and live from it uh, as, as mature adults. So um, some of the features uh, of this kind of mode of religious education as, as I see it. Um, so one would be um, going out um, to, uh, to the young people. Um, there has been an assumption and there continues to be an assumption in many of our parishes, congregations and schools uh, that the that are the the children, the people that we educate, they need to come here to us. They need to come to our church building. They need to come inside our our school. Um, but with so many people leaving the church, uh, not occupying those same spaces, uh, it's increasingly important uh, for the religious educators, uh, the faith leaders, to to go out um, to meet people uh, on their own terms. Uh, and to encourage uh, the young people to take the initiative uh, in a way to take the lead in their own religious education or religious formation. Um, so this might mean uh, getting out of classrooms, getting out of church basements, as, as many people have been doing already, uh, going into the places where the young people are, into the bars, the cafes, the virtual spaces. Um, we have a, a good crowd here from Boston College, so some are probably familiar with the Agape Latte program that began at Boston College and it has now spread to over 50 universities, um, where they have taken these conversations about faith uh, into the spaces that students occupy, into the cafes, for, for example, uh, and given the young people initiative, letting them pick the, the adults who they respect, who they want to hear from, and inviting that person to speak from a faith perspective to the concerns of, of the young people. Um, so regardless of whether this, this involves actually uh, going out or into a particular physical space, uh, something that I see is really key is a, is a sort of spiritual going out, a kenosis, uh, a sense of humility on the part of religious educators uh, that it's not, uh, they need to come to me so I can give them uh, information, uh, but a willingness to to go to uh, to go to the other person. Um, so secondly, uh, as I've already been highlighting, maybe I'll just be brief about this, uh, is really taking seriously uh, the importance of listening uh, to, to the young person. Uh, listening, uh, not, not in a patronizing way, not just humoring the person, but generally listening so as to, to learn and to understand uh, you know, from this person, um, not, not preaching at them, not judging what they have to say, um, and this is, you know, we've, I think we're going to, we're going to talk a ton about this in this session. And it is so important because among other reasons, this is explicitly what young people are telling us. For example, in a, a national study done by the Springtide Institute, when they ask people, um, what helps you in times of uncertainty? Uh, they say it's, it's not people giving them answers. Uh, it's someone simply listening to them deeply. Um, it's important for us to invite exploration. Uh, as I already said, young people want to, um, they want to seek answers on their own terms. Uh, and if we hope to share something with them of the tradition, 
uh, we need to encourage them to do that on, on their own terms. So to encourage their questioning, to even uh, encourage the challenges that they might pose uh, to our religious uh, traditions. Um, and I cited some, uh, some examples of that in, in my paper that I'm gonna skip just for the sake of time. Um, we, as Diane has already pointed out, um, Another thing that's really crucial in this mode of educating is forming supportive rela uh, relationships. Um, people who are not just teachers, not just uh, dispensers of information, but mentors and people who are willing to journey alongside uh, the, the young person to invest in them, uh, to care for them, to show that they, are, um, that they are someone who is important and valued. And again, the research has for, for decades borne out the importance and the impact of those kind of adult relationships. Um, and so as a final point, um, we might be wondering in this kind of model, what, what the role is of uh, quote unquote, expert religious educators. Um, surely uh, young people can, um, can just walk alongside one another. Why do they need someone who's been trained in religious education? Uh, but I would suggest there, that there is a role, um, that uh, we have this uh, ability to share some wisdom from the traditions that have, have formed us. Uh, and Diane was sharing one particular example in terms of Ignatian discernment. This is an example of a gift that can be brought forth from the Christian tradition. Um, but it can be a challenging thing to, um, to respond to a person's needs, uh, it's very easy to walk into a classroom and to read from a textbook or to read from notes, but to respond to a person's live questions, needs, concerns uh, requires um, some degree of, of skill and expertise, uh, which is hopefully something that we're, we're all of us are trying to develop in, in our different hamlets. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll leave it off for there and I look forward to the, the conversation to follow. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Patrick Fanning. Let's give a round of applause, an online round of applause to Patrick. Okay, Patrick has also given us a lot to think about, a lot to process and reflect. Uh, let's again, take a deep breath and uh, let's write down our questions for Patrick and let's keep it until our open forum at the end where you can ask him those questions. Okay, now it's time for a synodal conversation. Let's, after Patrick and Diane have presented their stuff, now it's time uh, for us to, to talk about these things in, in prayer and in communal discernment. Uh, so we invite you now uh, to prepare your space and your body for a time of reflection. Come away as much as you can from clutter and busyness in your room, in your minds, in your hearts. Shut the door if you need and are able to and become present to this online community that you see before you. While you breathe in, be conscious of God's spirit coming into you, filling your lungs. Fill your lungs with the divine energy God brings. And while you breathe out, imagine you're breathing out all that stands in the way of the spirit, all the obstacles, disordered attachments, all the unfreedoms. Imagine you see your whole body becoming radiant and alive through this process of breathing in God's life-giving spirit and breathing out. We invoke the spirit who dwells in us, among us and beyond us. The spirit who has gathered us and is calling us to listen to each other and to the spirit's movements within and among us. And in true Ignatian fashion, we bring, we ask, this is the grace that we ask for. We, we pray for this grace. We ask for the grace for openness and generosity that we may better accompany young people in faith. We ask for the grace for openness and generosity that we may better accompany young people in faith. And as we enter into this communal discernment, we bring forth this question into prayer. After listening to Diane and Patrick, and after listening to our own prayers, 
let's ask how can we as religious educators better accompany young people in the promises and challenges of the, of the digital age and this affiliation? How can we, as religious educators, better accompany young people in the promises and challenges of the digital age and this affiliation? And together, uh, we pray this prayer that they pray to start the synods, to invoke the spirit, and we pray that the spirit will be with us today in our spiritual conversation. We stand before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather together in your name. With you alone to guide us, make yourself at home in our hearts. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. We are weak and sinful. Do not let us promote disorder. Do not let ignorance lead us down the wrong path, nor partiality influence our actions. Let us find in you our unity so that we may journey together to eternal life and not stray from the way of truth and what is right. All this we ask, ask of you who are at work in every place and time in the communion of the Father and the Son forever and ever. Amen. All right. So, uh, since we are a big group, kind of, uh, we're going to divide uh, the group into three breakout rooms. And uh, to facilitate our central conversation, uh, we have, uh, oh, that there's me. Uh, I'm Rafael Yabut from Boston College. Uh, and then we also have uh, Julius Forquerino. I'll just introduce him. Uh, he's a Filipino PhD student at the Faculty of Theology and Religious Studies of Cayo Leuven, and he is also a Fundamental Research Fellow of the FWO in Flanders, Belgium. Before pursuing his graduate studies, Julius worked as a Catholic religious education teacher for elementary and secondary students, as well as a theology instructor for university students. His current project is an empirical, practical, theological, and post-colonial research on religious education in Catholic schools in the Philippines, and his research interests include religious education, practical theology, post-colonial studies, spirituality, and education. So hi, Julius. Can you say hi? Hello. Okay. And then our other facilitator is Dr. Patricia Lambino. Hello. Uh, she is an assistant professor at the Department of Theology at Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines. And she currently teaches an undergraduate course in Ignatian Discernment and graduate courses in religious education. And after completing her doctorate at the Catholic University of America, uh, she has been doing research on Philippine catechesis in, in enculturation, sorry, and popular religiosity. So hello, Dr. Patricia Lambino. Okay. Oh, we have, uh, we have decreased in number, but it's okay. Uh, all right. So the spirit is with us. Okay. So uh, sh shall we go into our breakout rooms? Welcome back, everyone. Uh, Miss Riley there. Hello, Riley. <laughs> Tom's dog. Uh, so uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for that rich sharing conversation. Uh, do we want to report back? So we have five minutes uh, to report back and to ask questions uh, about the process. How is the process for you? And also... Uh, just to open up the floor for questions for Diane and Patrick. Okay. All right, uh, I think I should start just reporting back to the whole group. Uh, our, our synodal group, uh, we, we, uh, there are two themes that emerged from our conversation. Uh, first, uh, we need to have more intergenerational dialogue. Uh, so it's, uh, it's listening to young people, but also uh, religious educators should also uh, take into account the adults in the community. So, uh, so we can create more spaces. We need to involve the adults. We need to involve everyone, the whole community. And uh, secondly, uh, when it comes to uh, contextual, uh, when it comes to constructive uh, development of the children, we need to take into account the context in which that development happens. So that's my group speaking. So I'll also report for my group. So in our group, um, I think the most emergent uh, theme has to be the, the intentional designing of all the spaces for community. So uh, whether it's a digital space or even spaces in the church or in our, uh, in our parish communities, uh, the question is how do we intentionally make them like a spaces for relationships, for accompaniment, for forgiveness, um, 
some themes emerge when it comes to um, but when we do this, um, how do we do it? Do we uh, how do we make it consistently a space for belonging? So where the young people are not just there for um, grunt work, it's uh, actually for good participation. They can actually participate, authentically relate to one another, where they can experience some, um, um, they, they can share, they can be heard, but at the same time be also critical about their, their own ideas. Um, an additional insight that was drawn from our, uh, that, to, that, that we got from the conversation is, um, yes, we also make the space intentional uh, for community, but how do we also go out? So go out without forcing them in. So, so how do we listen to accompany those who are also don't see the, themselves affiliated with any other community? So, and basically, how do we use this space well? So whether it's the digital space or uh, our regular spaces in our classrooms or uh, in our churches, how do we make that space? Uh, like a communal space or relational space for everybody. Thank you. Yeah, and just Thank quick. You. <laughs> it's almost impossible to summarize uh, the very back <laughs> discussion. Let me just pick two things. Uh, one, the broad orientation. What was going on was a discernment of spirits uh, about our context. Uh, that if it is a discernment of spirits, it has to be filled with hope. And it is because of our God who reveals. That's one general orientation. We're committed to that vision. Second, we had particulars. We had specifics uh, that we learned throughout the process. Examples of these specific social media uh, is ambiguous. It can be used for education, but also for distraction and a bunch of other examples like that. So overall, I would say that uh, it was a fruitful conversation. I was very happy to learn from uh, the people who shared in our group. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lambino. We have one minute. Wow. Uh, so there's a question here from Paulus. Uh, Paulus is still here. Uh, this is a question directed to Diane. Uh, my question is, uh, how do we educate teens and adolescents in the age of post-truth? And will you use Ignatian discernment? So Dan, do you want to respond yeah, to that? I'll try to be very brief. Um, I think so post-truth gets to the point also of fake news. And I think, so on the one hand, we're I think people are trying to correct fake news, but I think it's deeper than that. I think what I was getting at more is it's not just a commitment to like facts it's also a commitment to right relationships and I think that's key in this post-truth age whether it's conversations online or in person and I think the reason I named one practice which is Ignatian discernment is I think practices are formative for our engagement with one another and spiritual uh, religious traditions offer such promising practices I'll stop there all right, thank you, Diane. Uh, does thank anyone else want to share? Okay. All right, this it's uh eight thirty in uh in, in my part of the world. Uh, so mindful of the time. Uh, we shall end our session there. Uh, thank you so much for joining. This has been such a rich uh conversation and two rich uh, presentations we had. Thank you so much, Diane, and thank you so much, Dr. Patrick Manning, for your paper presentations. And hopefully, our conversation continues as we uh, as we continue to collaborate with one another and as uh, the conference continues to unfold. So uh, enjoy the conference, everyone. And don't forget to check out the announcements Padlet. It's, the link is in the comment section. And please uh, fill out the feedback form for this session, which is also at the comments. And Chuck left. Uh, uh, quote from Pope Francis, please read it on your way up. So thank you so much. And I hope you have a good evening, good day, and good afternoon.